I'm so glad to see so many of you here, so many current students who recognize what a treasure we have here at Wake Forest in Dr. Edwin Wilson, our Provost Emeritus. Uh, I am Lynn Sutton. I am Dean of the Z. Smith Reynolds Library and Vice Provost. And uh, it has been my pleasure and honor to know Dr. Wilson for the 10 years that I've been here at Wake Forest. I think all of us here at ZSR Library feel a special connection to Dr. Wilson for a couple of reasons. One is we work in a building where one half of the building is named for him. <laughs> the Wilson Wing, if you weren't aware, when they say go to the Wilson Wing, this is where that comes from. Uh, he comes to work almost every day, so we get to see him quite regularly and get to talk to him. And also, uh, ZSR Library is the site of the um, Wake Forest uh, Writers Hall of Fame. And that was put in place in 2012. And he was in the inaugural class, as was his distinguished wife, uh, Emily Wilson. And so we get to see his picture every day as well. And there's mm. even a bust in the atrium. So oh. we feel very well connected to Dr. Wilson. And, and I hope you will get to know him better through this experience. So when the um, Writers Hall of Fame was uh, installed in 2012, the Wake Forest Magazine ran a story on it, and they wrote up a little profile of Dr. Wilson. And I would like to read that to you now. Edwin Graves Wilson, known to many as Mr. Wake Forest, has spent his entire adult life, with the exception of wartime and graduate school, at Wake Forest University. Dr. Wilson first came to the university at the age of 16, is that true? 16. <laughs> and he graduated summa cum laude in 1943. He was editor of The Howler and a member of Phi Beta Kappa and Omicron Delta Kappa Honor Societies. After serving in the Navy for three years, he returned to Wake Forest to teach English for one year before going to Harvard to earn his PhD in 1952 in English. Is this all true so far? Yes, okay. <laughs> He returned to North Carolina to join the Wake Forest faculty and made the move to the, uh, with the university to Winston-Salem in 1956. In his time at Wake Forest, Dr. Wilson served as an English professor, as dean of the college, as the university's first provost, senior vice president, and now provost emeritus. He helped found the Gra Babcock Graduate School of Management in 1970 and was instrumental in the university's edition of study abroad programs both in Venice and in London. In retirement, Dr. Wilson has remained active, at times teaching and continually assisting his alma mater, including writing The History of Wake Forest University, Volume 5, 1967 to 1983. He is an expert on British Romantic poetry and the poetry of William Butler Yeats and Dylan Thomas, and he is renowned for his passionate recitations of poetry. And I can attest that not only are his recitations passionate, but he does them without looking at a note. Mm -hmm. He can just say them. Uh, Dr. Wilson embodies the ideals, values, and spirit of Wake Forest and has been inspirational to generations of students, <coughs> faculty, and alumni, of which you are about to become future <laughs> alumni. In 1966, Esquire named him one of 33 super profs based on student recommendations. Dr. Wilson is also the recipient of the Wake Forest Medallion of Merit, which is the university's highest honor, also the North Carolina Humanities <coughs> Council's highest honor, and the North Carolina Award for Public Service. He lives here in Winston-Salem, just off Faculty Drive with his wife, Emily. So that is who you're about to <coughs> have a conversation with. So um, Dr. Wilson, we have a, numbers of a number of questions for you. I have two opening questions, and they were um, devised by suggestions from students and from fellows. And then after those two opening questions, which you got a hint of, I heard, <laughs> <laughs> um, we will open it up to the audience here, and you can ask Dr. Wilson whatever you would like to know. Now, Dr. Wilson has said he prefers probably faculty like to walk around and answer uh, as he's answering. So. Mm -hmm. You can do whatever you want. Okay. All right. Here's the first question. Dr. Wilson, you've experienced Wake Forest in many different capacities. As a student, a professor, a provost, and now a retired faculty member residing in the library. Could you identify at which stage 
you enjoyed Wake Forest the most? Well, thank you. Can you hear me? <coughs> Let me begin by saying that I'm getting over a slight cold. Nothing contagious, I think, but many people, including myself, have had colds, so I may sound a little hoarse today. Let me also say that uh, I am somewhat hard of hearing, so when you ask a question, I may ask you to repeat it so that I can understand. Thank you, Lynn, for the introduction, which is gracious as always. The question had to do with my various roles that I have played at Wake Forest in my life. I think whether you savor a particular role in your life depends in large part on how old you are when you play that role. Obviously at 18 or 19, I did not envision that I might someday be here talking with you. I was just a college boy getting through college as best I could with a great deal of pleasure and excitement. For me, college, I think, had less to do with learning, though that was important, than with friendship. As a boy in high school, I had been somewhat shy and did not find it easy to make close friends. I don't know whether any of you have experienced that moment in your life or not. But I came to Wake Forest and almost immediately I was overwhelmed by friendship. The first time I walked across the old campus, I was greeted by people who seemed to want to know me. And so, year by year, I met people, enjoyed their company, and savored what I think is the exceptional opportunity of being among a small group of people your age with whom you have confidences to make and with whom you have experiences that you want to have. So in a way, my years as a student have not been succeeded by anything quite that spectacular because it was so novel for me. As a boy, I would have been a Magnolia scholar if there had been Magnolia scholars at that time because I was a first generation student. Neither my father nor my mother had been to college. So this was a strange experience for them as well as for me. And there is something special about that. And that's why I would simply say to any of you who are students now, make every day reveal something for yourself about your environment and the people you come to know. When I was a senior in college, I still remember this, I was 20 years old, and I began to think about what I wanted to do in the future. Let me say that in those days, students did not think so much about what was going to happen after college, I think. They thought about what was going to happen in college the next day, the next year. And I said to myself as a senior, I love Wake Forest so much that if the opportunity ever comes, I will return, having no idea that the opportunity would come. And then, as Lynn said, I was for three years in the Navy and four years at Harvard, and then in 1951, I was given an offer to come back to Wake Forest to teach. 
and I did. That was the fall of 1951 in which groundbreaking for this campus occurred. So I arrived at Wake Forest knowing that within a few years I'd be leaving Wake Forest, the town of Wake Forest, and coming to Winston-Salem. And frankly, life has been very good ever since. I would like to say a little bit, because Lynn has asked the question, about being a teacher and being an administrator. Nothing that can happen in the administration, I think, gives one as much pleasure as being in the classroom. I had good years, I think, they were happy years for me, as dean and as provost, good years. But my own feeling is that the further an adult goes from students, the less charm there is in being on a college campus. Administrative work is important, is necessary, and I can count day after day when I reveled in the opportunity I had. But as you move into administration, and I don't want to hurt the feelings of those of you in here who are in administration, <laughs> but as you move into administration from having been a teacher, what you miss is this. Students, after all, are why we are here. There would not be teachers without students. And there certainly would not be administrators without students. You are why we are here. And if you savor college life as much as I did, and if you savor being on a college campus as much as I do, it is because of you all. Doris Betts, who was a very fine North Carolina writer who lived at Chapel Hill, she said after she retired, looking back on her career, that she had a wonderful career. She said, the only thing I regret was the time that I spent in committee meetings. <laughs> And if you're an administrator, you do a great deal of that. I know that most of the student friends that I met through my years, I met because I had them in class. And those friendships survive, many of them. And I'm grateful for that. Then let me say that one thing, however, which was important about being in the administration, very important, was that I had an opportunity to view and to learn and to help the university in its totality. A faculty member can have a very narrow point of view. I have known faculty members at Wake Forest, and I'm sure there are some still here, who live their lives in the classroom and at the computer and at home. But beyond them are all those people who keep the university going and who try to guide the university in the best possible direction. And what I believe so strongly as an administrator was that the task of a Wake Forest administrator was to move ahead in many important ways to get the benefits of a growing university, but at the same time see to it that the values that make Wake Forest Wake Forest are not lost in the process. And that requires that requires, on the part of the president, the provost, the deans, and everyone, a great deal of effort. 
So to go back to my original comment, I have loved each stage for different reasons. I've even loved retirement <laughs> in its own way because I have a chance to come to the library. There you go. Every morning. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> so. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, your second warm up question is I dare say no one has. Uh, been able to experience Wake Forest from nearly every aspect and vantage point the way you have. Mm -hmm. So is it possible for you to pick out your most memorable experience or say what it is about Wake Forest you love the most? My most memorable experience? Well, I guess my most memorable experience was meeting my wife-to-be <laughs> one morning as I crossed the campus from Renolda Hall to the library. She was a young woman who had just begun teaching English here. And I had left, I was dean at the time, I had left my office in Renolda Hall, I had crossed over to the library, and I saw this young woman standing there in front of the library. And I said, this is somebody that I think I would like to get to know. <laughs> and I said to her, I would like to get to know you. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, how would you like to come tonight to a spaghetti supper at my apartment? And I said, I'd love it. <laughs> And six months later, in Columbus, Georgia, we married. Wow. And we celebrated our 50th anniversary last summer. Oh. So I guess, <laughs> I guess if I have to remember one event, I would like to mention. <laughs> and she's not even here. You didn't have to say that. <laughs> um, incidentally, uh, what I'm about to say reveals something I think that is very important about all of us as human beings. You ask about memorable experiences. It's strange how some little something that happened in a few minutes, you remember years and years and years later. Even when you've forgotten, let's say, the entire content of a course, and you someday will look back on moments that were revelatory in some special way. I'd like to mention two for me that were important as that college boy of 18. I took a course in religion, uh, the teachings of Jesus, from a man named Olin Binkley you would not know his name, except that he was a longtime professor of religion at Wake Forest. And if you've ever been to Chapel Hill, or if you're a Baptist, Binkley Baptist Church in Chapel Hill is named for him. I turned in my examination to Dr. Binkley, and he returned it. And he wrote on my examination paper, your work pleases me, OTB. That's all he said. He didn't call me up to congratulate me. He didn't even emphasize the fact that I'd made an A. He simply said, your work pleases me. And that sent a kind of shiver through me. You know those little things? I think, you, I think you discover as time goes by, maybe, that a few words of that type can mean as much to you as anything that happens. To let you know that you're on the right track somehow. And the other thing, which I'm very proud of, I probably shouldn't tell this. <coughs> I wrote a column for Old Golden Black every week. 
The name of the column, by the way, was Pro Humanitate, which I sort of borrowed. <laughs> <laughs> One day I was crossing the campus, the old campus, going from one building to another. And I saw coming toward me Dr. Hubert McNeil Petit, who was the most distinguished scholar at Wake Forest, taught Latin, and was also a dynamic professor. People crowded his classrooms to hear him. I was a little scared of Dr. Petit. Frankly, everybody was scared of him. You would have been scared of him. There was something overpowering about his personality. He seemed so much smarter and so much bigger than anybody else. I was walking across the campus. He was coming the other way. He was wearing a hat. As he approached me, this still makes me shiver. As he approached me, he took off his hat and bowed to me. Can you imagine that? <laughs> the reason he did was that he had read and liked a column that I had written for Old Golden Black. He just did that. Something like that remains in your blood. And I'm sure you're going to have memories of that sort, too. But anyway, those are a few moments. That's excellent. <laughs> OK. OK, now we will open up the field to questions. So who would like to ask the first question? Yes. One's cause in life. The question is, what it, do I have any advice on finding one's cause in life? Uh, before I answer that question, I'm going to have to admit one or two things about myself. One is that, as you may have guessed already, I am a romantic. <laughs> I am also intuitive rather than analytical. Can I make that distinction? I believe a lot in feeling. I believe in understanding oneself. I didn't go to Wake Forest because I had read college catalogs and looked at rankings. I went to Wake Forest because I liked it. I didn't know whether it was as good as Carolina or Duke or Davidson or not. I didn't care. This was to be my school. So I also believe in looking at life as an opportunity that somehow, if it's going to be happy, is going to be built on something that intuitively causes you to be at home where you are. And this is built upon your education, of course. It is also built upon your friendships, of course. It is also built, and this is hard to talk about, and I hope I can make sense. It is also built on what I would call any opportunities we have for transcendence. I don't mean that in a necessarily religious or spiritual way. I'm using the word transcendence differently. I think everyone in college at certain times can feel oppressed, can feel over busy, can feel neglected, can feel forgotten. This is true of everybody. 
because somehow the burdens of going to class and the burdens of keeping up with college life can be merciless sometimes. So it's necessary to find, and I think this is related to a career, I think it's necessary to find something that when the occasion calls for it, can lift you out of yourself to a higher level of understanding. This is why some students, unhappily, turn to alcohol or drugs. Something that they think for the moment will make themselves somehow bigger or happier or more content than they have been before. I know that happens. But there are other ways in which you can conquer those moments in which somehow life seems inadequate. It can be religion, it can be books, it can be movies, it can be travel. It also, I think, can be something that gives you a creative opportunity to enlarge yourself in some direction. That's why sports are so important. Many young people find transcendence in sports. Others find transcendence in playing a part in the theater. Others find transcendence in dancing. Others find it in listening to music. Others find it in the endless joys of knowing other people. This is a long way to your question. <laughs> I don't think as you look for what you're going to do with your life, that you read books or get too concerned about your major. Be more concerned about yourself. What is, it, what is it that in life makes it possible for you on the darkest days to find happiness? For some reason, I found happiness in teaching. And nothing else mattered anymore. Some of you will find it in law or medicine or business or whatever it might be. But don't rule out the possibility that what you want to do is something that is somehow related to your inner self rather than to your college degree. And if you're fortunate, that can happen. But never surrender yourself to the obvious groping for what is called success without deciding what kind of success you want. Is that okay? <laughs> That's a long answer. I don't know. It's a wonderful answer. Who has another question? Over there. In the If there's a spot on campus that is especially um, your favorite place, or maybe there's a rhythm, I, it sounds like the walk from Renolda Hall to the ZSR <laughs> is now special yeah. for you, but is there, is there a rhythm that you've always kept, or um, maybe in those dark days that you kind of repeat that rhythm, or a place that you go on campus? That's a place? Yes, sir. A place on campus. 
I can't say it's the atrium of the library. Why not? <laughs> because I confront myself there. <laughs> I can't say that. Uh, uh, One of my favorite places is the Tower of White Chapel. How many of you have been there? Most of you, good. I like heights. I have a little acrophobia, so I don't get too close to the edge. <laughs> but I like the concept of heights. <laughs> and. I like standing there in the Tower of White Chapel and looking to the north, seeing Pilot Mountain, which I recommend to you as a good place to go also. And looking south, the Reynolds Building. Do you know that White Chapel is on an axis from Pilot Mountain to the Reynolds Building downtown? If you drew a straight line, it would be there. Someone once remarked that that proves that you can serve both God and mammon. Do you know that line from the Bible, you cannot serve both God and mammon? Well, God, mammon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I can't think of any other I like triple C216, because that's where I taught. No. <laughs> yeah. Right here. What do you think is most worth preserving at Wake Forest? What is wor most worth preserving at Wake Forest? You probably would have already guessed this. I think what is most preserving is all the intimacy of relations between students, teachers, librarians, people who work on the grounds. Worth preserving all those intimate relationships. I said to a reporter from Old Golden Black, in fact, he quoted me in the paper last week, I said that very often I'm out in front of the library waiting for a ride. And I enjoy sitting there for five or ten minutes or standing there watching the people come by and talking with some of them and saying hello to others. But in general, noticing the flow of human traffic there. I know we worry a great deal about becoming too large. And I personally would rather we not have more students than we have now. On the other hand, I think there are things that we have that make that intimacy possible and worth keeping. One is that we have maintained our class size so that there are very few classes that you take which are too large. When I was a graduate student at Harvard, I was a teaching assistant to a very prominent man in American literature. He taught a class in American literature which enrolled about 250 students. We met in an auditorium like Brindle. And all these students would come to class three times a week, and he would come in and lecture. My job as his assistant was to make out his examinations. I would listen to his lectures, then I would create 
an exam to give. And I would come to class and distribute the exams. My next job was to grade the exams. And the only opportunity he had to become involved with a student was if a student went to see him and complained about my grade. <laughs> and one time I know a student went to see him and said, Wilson has been too strict. And he said, well, if there's anything wrong with his grade, he's been too lenient. Now, I'm telling you that story only because here was an undergraduate course at what is sometimes thought to be the best university in the land, which was not nearly, not nearly as good as an undergraduate course that I had taken at Wake Forest in American literature. So an intimacy disappears when smallness becomes bigness, then something which I think is dramatically necessary for the survival of Wake Forest I love has gone. So, is that okay? <laughs> yeah. You see, so much of what I'm saying has to do with people. I think that's what it boils down to, not books, not books. Yes, sir. My name is Parker Fritz. I'm a senior studying politics and international affairs. Um, we've had some difficult discussions over the last few years, and especially uh, the last few semesters, about diversity and yeah. inclusion uh, on this campus. Can you take us a few, uh, through a few of those moments uh, in Wake Forest history that you saw the campus changing before your eyes and how we can take those moments and learn from them and go forward with them. Yes. I think it's obvious, and I share this attitude, it's obvious that the Wake Forest administration is committed to diversity and inclusion. I think there's no doubt that President Hatch, Rogan, Kirsch, and everyone else has that as a goal. Look, by the way, at the spread in the library that you encounter coming from the atrium by the circulation desk, and you can see the story of diversity and inclusion. But I would like to say to any of you who are concerned about these issues now, that every step toward diversity and inclusion has been greeted by anger and scorn by some people. In 1962, for example, when the faculty voted to let Wake Forest become integrated, 1962, there were faculty members who were against it, who thought that this was an unacceptable way to plan the future. They did not think we should admit African Americans. About 1979, when we invited Maya Angelou to become the first Reynolds professor at Wake Forest, I received, I was provost at the time, I received cruel and angry letters saying, in effect, why? Why would you pick that black woman to join the faculty? So keep in mind that whenever you take steps forward toward a better representation of African Americans, of Hispanics, or Asians, or whomever in the student body, or whenever you look toward the necessity of having more women and more representatives of minorities in position, you must expect that there are those who will say that's wrong. But we have to keep moving ahead because I think we have to realize deep down within us 
that in spite of complaints, in spite of objections, history is on our side. So if there are days when you feel somehow alarmed that the sort of utopian ideal of respect and dignity for everybody has not yet quite been met, when you see indications of a contrary attitude of people not being willing to show respect for others, remember that you're on the side of progress. And that's where I think Wake Forest is. And the beautiful thing about it to me is that the dream that I had for Wake Forest when I was on an all-white campus, because when I was a student, there were no blacks on the campus. But the dream that I have is now a dream that can be shared by everybody. And all of us can say that Wake Forest is, is our school. Thank you. Thank you. That helps, that helps me a lot. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and look at the room. So your dream came true. I know, too. I know. Yeah, yeah. I'm so pleased to see. I wonder, just for curiosity, how many of you are freshmen? Uh-huh. How many of you are sophomores? Mm-hmm. Juniors? Seniors? Pretty well distributed. Yeah. How many of you are employees? One place or another? Yeah. I see all the librarians. <laughs> <laughs> right. yeah. Thank you. A next question. Over here. Whoops. Oh. All right, you're after him then. <laughs> Could you talk about your favorite sports memory um, of Wake throughout? My favorite sport? Yes, your sports memory of Wake throughout the time you've been here. Your favorite sports memory? Oh, my favorite sports memory. I'm sorry. Thank you. Well, I'll have to admit, and a few of you know this, a few of my friends, my favorite sport, not because I can play it, is basketball. And I had a miserable time last night <laughs> at the Joel Coliseum. Uh, I go to all the home basketball games. I, I enjoy football, but it is basketball that grabs my love and attention. So my favorite memory were the two or three years when Wake Forest won the ACC championship in the 1990s under the guiding hand of Tim Duncan and Randolph Childress. I don't know how many of you know about those years, but in the mid-1990s, when we had Duncan and Childress here, and night after night, we beat our famous rivals <laughs> over in Greensboro at the Coliseum in Greensboro. I've had no experience in sports comparable to that. And I'm glad Randolph Childress is back here as an assistant coach. And I'm glad that Tim Duncan has become almost the most admired person in professional basketball, I would say. Two graduates we can be proud of. And they both graduated. Parenthetically, <laughs> that, that's, that's important. Over here. That's not always true at Kentucky. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> if there are any Kentuckians here, I apologize. Huh. Was there a, oh Over yeah. Here. I can hear you without that if, you, if I get close. <laughs> Mm -hmm. How do you feel about that? And how has there any has there been a time in past years where um, people displayed their I don't know, um, feelings about others and their questions? 
she's talking about the things that were scrawled on a sidewalk. Uh, I did not see the sidewalk, and I've not been involved in discussions. So I don't know exactly what was said or who said it. I'm not aware of any experience of that particular kind in the past. There may have been, and I may not have known about them. The usual experiences in the past had to do with, I mean, when there were problems, had to do with unacceptable fraternity party themes. And I do remember some of them. More in the past than now, I think. That was always a problem. But I don't remember people going to that particular outlet, like a sidewalk, to express their feelings. I regret it, but I, I, don't, I, I don't know that much about it. I have not, since I'm retired, I have not been in the administrative cabinets discussing all these things. And I know that people have deplored them and have tried to deal with them. I understand, by the way, that uh, Melissa Harris Perry has said some very competent and intelligent things about all that. And I respect her a great deal. Down here. We talk a lot about the importance of person-to-person contact mm -hmm. and friendship. And so what do you think is the, will be the impact of technology kind of on our generation's education and in the classroom? That's a question I wish I could help with. <laughs> uh, she asked about the impact of technology. I will have to admit that I am a pre-technological person. I am still the kind of person who writes letters by hand rather than using the email if I can. I think it's much better if I want to say something appreciative to somebody else to say so in my own hand, rather than to send a quick email message. So I belong in an ancient era, and sometimes I feel a little lost in the current era. The question, I think technology is unavoidable. I know that uh, Twitter and Facebook and all those things are at hand, and that people use them. And I know that some of you maybe even walk around the campus using a cell phone even as you talk. And I'm not going to be critical of that because that's, I know that's the way the world is constructed now and we depend upon that. I know that when I stand on the fourth floor bridge looking down at the atrium and see students studying, that I hardly ever see a book. I see the computers. And that gives me a twinge sometimes that we have become so much a creature of machines. But I also know that we have to take this technology and somehow weave it into our lives in such a way that we can use it creatively, but that we can also leave time, leave time for the more blissful experiences of life. That's not a very good answer. But I'm not, I'm not wise enough to say, because I tend to ignore most of it. Really. <laughs> really. Okay, yeah. up here. So my question is, um, so you, your column in the OGB was called Pro Humanitate, and I know something that's very important to you on Wake Forest campus is the interpersonal relationships that we all develop here. Can you talk a little bit more about what Pro Humanitate means to you? What Pro Humanitate means? Mm -hmm. Pro Humanitate has taken on different meanings as time has gone by. When it was devised as a motto 
during the administration of William Louis Petit. William Louis Petit was president from 1905 to 1927. So we go back for a whole century. And that was when pro humanitate came into being. At that time, Wake Forest was still very much a Baptist college, as you probably know. I'm not a Baptist myself, so I can say that with great respect. It was a splendid Baptist college. And pro humanitate really echoed the mission that Jesus gave to his disciples to go out into the world and serve humanity. It was really, I think, primarily a missionary call. Go out and preach the gospel and help people. The other meaning that it had was that it suggested that Wake Forest, at its heart, is devoted to the liberal arts, to the humanities, so that it exalted those studies which free people from ignorance and which do not necessarily prepare people for careers. Literature, history, religion, philosophy, art, music, all those things. So it had a kind of meaning. And when I, as I said earlier, when I took the title Pro Humanitate for my column for Old Gold and Black, I wrote about the arts, not about religion. Because I thought that was well within the meaning of the motto. I think as time has gone by, and we have lost the exclusively religious commitment of the college. We're much more secular now, of course. Then pro humanitate has been seen as an ideal that is worth expanding. Expanding to include everyone. Expanding to include humanity. We exist for people. We exist for people, whoever they are and wherever they come from. And we embrace and love them, whoever they are and wherever they come from. So we are for humanity. And that has led us to be not just a small college in a small North Carolina town, but a university that is reaching out to the world. A university where more than half of our students go abroad at some time during their four years. A university where a number of our students come from abroad to study here. And a university where we feel that whoever a person is, black or white, straight or gay, whatever you want to say, that any person deserves our respect and deserves to be given dignity. I think that's what pro humanitate means now. And it's simply an enlargement of an ideal which is still worth treasuring, but is expanded to include something different. Hope that's okay. Mm -hmm. Question oh. over here. Dr. Wilson. Yes. I mentioned two earlier, Olin Binkley, who wrote that note on my paper, and Hubert Petit, who nodded to me on the campus. I would also mention Dr. Alan Easley, who was a religion professor, and whose name is on Alan Easley Drive over by the apartments. 
I remember Alan Easley, who was a wonderful man. I remember the day that he got up in the faculty meeting and argued for integration. It was a memorable speech. He didn't have notes. He was speaking from the heart, but he argued for it. I remember an English professor named Edgar Folk, F-O-L-K, whose great-granddaughter will be a freshman at Wake Forest next year, by the way. Four or five generations of Wake Forest people. I remember Dr. Edgar Folk, who taught English and also taught journalism. And I was sitting by myself. This is why I keep talking about the absolute significance of interpersonal relations. I was sitting by myself on the second floor of the English department. And he came by and saw me sitting there and he said, uh, who are you? And I introduced myself. And then he said, what are you going to major in? And I said, well, I think English. And he said, have you ever thought about writing for Old Golden Black? And I said, no. He said, why don't you? I don't know whether any of you work for Old Golden Black or not. But I did for all four years. And it made a difference. He encouraged me to write. And can I think of another? Well, though my contact with him was very brief, I remember Dr. Thurman Kitchen, who was president of Wake Forest, for whom Kitchen House is named. I have known, by the way, one, two, three, four, five presidents, which is very interesting to think about. All quite different. Dr. Kitchen was a quiet, humble man who very, who said very little. But again, I went down, I went by his office one day to interview him for Old Golden Black. And we had a wonderful conversation. And he taught me a lot about Wake Forest. He was president of Wake Forest College. He had a brother who was governor of North Carolina. And he had another brother who was speaker of the US House of Representatives. The Kitchen family was just filled with success. And Dr. Kitchen, from that successful family, presented himself so humbly and so much with that pride. And I thought for myself that was a, a great lesson to learn. Those are a few that I... Incidentally, one of my best friends, he and I shared so many experiences together. And I mention him today because he died just a couple of weeks ago. It was Ed Crispin, the longtime chaplain of Wake Forest, a splendid man from the old campus. I wonder if any of you ever met Ed Christman. Well, he was, he was special. I think we'll have one last question right here. Do you have a particular um, favorite classroom memory or a class that you taught when you were a professor at Wake? A favorite classroom memory. It's hard to You remember different things. <coughs> it's hard to think of a classroom memory without seeming immodest. And I've just talked about how important immodesty is. <laughs> but a poem that I've always loved and taught every year as long as I taught 
that I never thought I got quite right. You know, you can make a presentation in class of one kind or another. You can make the presentation, but something tells you that, well, it could have been better. I will leave this room today and I will say to myself, that could have been a lot better. I wish I had done so and so. Because you always think that somehow as hard as you try, something has eluded you. You, ha you haven't quite said in the way you wanted to say it what you wanted to say. It was not quite right. But one poem of Keats that I've always loved is Keats' his Ode to a Nightingale. I don't know whether you know that. My heart aches and a drowsy numbness pains my sense as though of hemlock I had drunk or emptied some dull opiate down the drain and lethal words had sunk. You have to study that a while. I had always had a problem not in understanding the Ode to a Nightingale and not in teaching it, but in teaching it in such a way that for the students, it was not just words. It was an understanding of life. It was not just something out of a textbook. It was something that really had to do with living the very lives that they lived. And I remember one day, I was teaching O to a Nightingale. And when I got through it, if I may say so, and this is immodest, when I got through it, I felt I had captured it. I felt I had really said what needed to be said. And I do remember that students came up after class and said, in effect, that was wonderful. You know, that makes you feel good. But it's also something that lets you know that you have to keep striving. You can't ever feel that you've reached perfection. You have to keep striving. And I like to think that uh, when I come to the library every day, I'm still striving for something. <laughs> well, I'd, I'd say you're getting there. Said, Let me say <laughs> how, uh, what a great audience this has been and how attentive you have been. And I hope that somehow, somewhere along the way, something I have said does make sense. But thank all of you. And thank you, Lynn, and thank all the librarians, and thank Ken Bennett, who's over there taking pictures, and everybody. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.